Hi there, Scott Nicholson here, Syracuse University School of Information Studies professor. Welcome to session number 16 in the Gaming and Libraries course. Now, over last week, I talked through the five different gaming archetypes, gave you a lot of ideas of different uh, things you can explore. And today, what I'm going to do is talk about selecting games. So you've got the archetypes, but there's a little bit more you have to do before you can actually go and pick out the games. First thing you need to think about is what sort of program you want to put on. And there are a few basic program types that you can consider. The first is an open play activity. In an open play activity, you have a lot of different games out. You allow people to come in, play the games, enjoy meeting each other, and then, uh, and then leave. And it's usually a shorter program. Well, it's probably only going to run a couple hours. And for this type of activity, you want to have shorter length games and games that can handle a variety of player numbers. In this type of thing, the librarian, one of their roles is going to be kind of the mater d. They're going to be seating people, come in, there are two of you, what do you would like to play? And, and you lead people, and you're trying to make that connection between people and the games they'd like to play. These sorts of things are great for meeting a lot of different people and trying a lot of different games, but you want to avoid any long, complex games in this type of activity. Now, another type you can set up is a tournament. Now, in a tournament, what you're going to do is have it set up where people are competing to be the best at something. And this is going to draw on a very different type of player than in the first group. Um, this is going to draw people who already have experience with the game and want to show off how strong they are. And they can't do that at home, but they can do it in the library on a big screen. To run one of these tournaments, you can use any sort of a normal uh, tournament type system, a single or double elimination or a round robin tournament. To make it easy, Eli Nyberger has put together a system called GT System. And GT System is free to any library. You can go on, set up an account, and it will help you run your tournament. He's got everything in place to help you do it all. It's really a great tool, and I'd highly suggest it to any libraries wanting to get started with a tournament. Now, every year, there is National Gaming Day at your library. It's in November. And what's going to happen at that is there's going to be some national tournaments. And so that'll be a way that people can locally compete and then go for a national title across all the different libraries. Because in a tournament, people are going to get a lot more engaged with the game, the librarian will have to be an adjudicator. There may be times you're going to have to make rules calls and, and try and deal with people whose uh, emotions may get flared up because there's something to be gained from playing the game. So you've got to be aware of that. I would suggest, even when you're running a tournament, to have open play activities as well, because then you can draw on people who just like the open play activities, and then make sure you advertise that, that it's a tournament and other games to play. If you want to know more about tournaments, Eli's book, Gamers in the Library, I talked about that earlier, uh, is a great resource, and it talks about video game tournaments. That's really the main focus of the book. So I'd highly suggest checking out that book. Another way that libraries are integrating gaming is by tying it into existing services that they already have. A common example of this is through the summer reading program. In the summer, when you have kids coming in to read books, libraries are also putting together games that tie in with those books, either by selecting games that tie in with the theme of the books or selecting activities that make sense alongside a gathering for reading. I talked about one example earlier where you have a live action role playing game at the end where people come dressed up like their favorite book character, then they interact with each other like there's characters. That would be a very cheap gaming program to do alongside summer reading. But just doesn't have to be for kids. Adults could have a book talk, and after the book talk, you have a murder mystery based in that world of the book. Always look for opportunities where you take advantage of already existing programs and tie in some kind of a gaming program or use a gaming activity. We're seeing some academic libraries pursue the creation of information literacy games, games that help teach information literacy. They're, in, in general, not that great yet, but we're working on it. Now, another type of gaming program that you could use is a gaming club. The idea of a gaming club is it's going to meet regularly, every two weeks, every month, the first Saturday of every month, and they're going to play a certain type of game. So you might have a board game club, or a bridge club, or a scrabble club, or a Wii club. And the idea of the clubs is people know when they can come and engage in that specific type of game. You'll have to decide if you want to have the club focus on a specific game, like a bridge club, or on a general category of game, like a, like a Wii club. The important thing with the clubs is they need to be dependable. You need to have one day when people know they can come, whether it's the third Saturday of the month or every Tuesday or whatever it is. They know when they can come. And this is going to be the way to build up a really loyal core. And that loyal core can be very useful in tapping to get assistance for running the big programs, for running a big event where you want to bring a lot of people together. So think about starting a gaming club in your library. It can be a pretty inexpensive way to draw together and get your core of gamers engaged with you so they can help advise and help you run the bigger events. 
Now another type of program to consider is a game creation program. For all the different archetypes I talked about, you could have a game creation rather than just a game playing program where people or teams get together and actually make games. This can be a short term program where you have just a couple hours to make a game and then people will be able to play the game or it can be a longer term program which is going to run over some time where people will do things over say a semester. There's some tools for this. MIT has a tool called Scratch and that's a programming tool, but you could even use a game like Little Big Planet and allow people to have a game, a level creating program. You can have a modification program where people learn how to make mods. Um, or you could have a board game creation program where people try out a number of these board games I've talked about and then make their own and then allow everyone else to try out what they've made. These can be really great community events. You could actually have it as a family event. Come in as your family, we'll talk about game creation, and then as a family unit you go home and over the next month design a game and then come back and show the game off. Talk about a cool intergenerational event. Another idea would be to have a program specifically about gaming, such as having someone from the game industry come and talk about being in the game industry, working as a designer, or working as a programmer. This could be great for an academic library setting, especially if your school does not have a game design curriculum. Because a lot of folks who are in fields like math and physics and art, they could apply those skills and work in a game design setting or a game programming setting. And having some sort of a speaker about game programming, game creation could allow you to start up a club or some sort of creation activity that could bring those people and get them engaged with games. So now that you've decided what format you're going to have for your program, there's a few other variables to think about before you can actually select the games, and I call them the C's. You've got first, chance. You have to think, what is the role of chance that you want in these games? You can have games that are very high chance, something like bingo, very high chance. Anyone can win at bingo as long as they're able to dab the numbers. You know, I know when I go and play bingo at uh, one of the casinos and I get this little board with nine bingo cards and I'm desperately looking and I look over and there's a little old lady who's got 27 boards in front of her. She's like, you know, there's some skill involved. But in general, with bingo, people are comfortable with the game, but it's a pure chance game. Something on the other hand, like Go is more of a pure skill game. That, and this is why a Go player who's slightly better than another Go player is probably going to destroy them because there's no, there's, it's all a skill in the game. There's no chance it's going on. And so you have to decide that's a spectrum and different games are going to have different levels of chance. And you have to decide for your patrons and for your setting what tone do you want to do. Now the nice thing about chance, chance mitigates skill. So if you're going to have a tournament, for example, a bingo tournament, uh, kind of like a slot machine tournament is not something that's going to require, reward a lot of skill, which will draw on certain types of players. If you have a tournament, a uh, Wii Tennis tournament, for example, well Wii Tennis is a game that has a lot of luck. You swing the racket and it kind of sort of recognizes you're swinging and it kind of sort of hits the ball, but there's really a lot of luck involved. And again, that can be a tournament that's going to be open to a wider group. If you have a Mario Kart or Super Smash Bros. tournament, however, that's going to reward skill, as will something like Dance Dance Revolution. Again, that requires that skill, and there's not a lot of chance involved in what's going on. And so you've got to decide that role of chance versus uh, skill in the games that you're playing. The next variable to think about is complexity. How complex do you want the games to be? If you're going to do an open play activity where people come for a couple hours and leave, you do not want complex games. If you're going to do a weekly club, well, they could get into complex games or some larger event or a targeted event where you're drawing in certain types of players. Uh, some of the narrative board games I talked about, for example, are very complex but would require people to really commit a lot of time, but that has a lot of payoff. The more complex the game is, the more payoff that game can have as far as engagement with the game and engagement with the the people. Uh, the lighter the game is, sort of light, and it can be easy to create a community hub type space, but you're not going to get too heavily involved in the narrative of that game world. So again, you want to think about how complex you want the games to be. The next thing to consider is the level of competition or cooperation in the game. Now, there are games that are cooperative games, and so one of the best ones, best strategy board games out there that's a cooperative game is Pandemic. And so Pandemic is a game where you're running around trying to stomp out viruses, and so you're, it's completely a cooperative game. And then you've got games that are completely competitive games where you're working directly against each other. So if you've ever played, if you think about the, any of the fighting games on a computer, that's a very competitive game. You win by beating the other person. You win by the other person taking you doing damage to the other person and killing them. 
Um, so there's a lot of games in the middle. So there's a lot of games that are based upon how effective you are using your resources, sort of your resource management engine. And so this is things like Settlers of Catan, for example. Settlers of Catan is somewhere in the middle. There's some cooperation because you're trading with each other, but there's a lot of competition. But it's not necessarily as much direct competition as in other games. It's more about how effective you are. And there's some areas of direct competition because you're building roads and the roads, they don't intersect. And so one person can't cross over another person's road. So you've got some competition there. So you want to think about how much competition do I want? Because that's going to change the tone of the game place. And different player styles will appreciate different levels of competition. Some people want that competition. That's what they're looking for. Other people want something that is more collaborative or more cooperative. So you want to ask that question. Well, what's that level? So now that you have figured out your archetype, you figured out your event style, and you figured out these variables, now you're ready to pick out your games. This is where you want to tap into a local gaming group, some gaming experts, or a game shop. This is where if you've got a gaming club running, you can talk to them. Because then you can say, well, here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for an action game. I'm looking for it to be a cooperative action game. I'm looking to have it in an open play event so it's not that difficult to learn. They might say, oh, well, you want something like uh, Lego Star Wars. Lego Star Wars is a cooperative game, very light, would be a perfect fit for that type of event. This is where, just like librarians provide reader's advisory, you want to find someone to provide gamer's advisory. And hopefully someday, we will be a place of gamer's advisory, where gamers can come and ask us, well, I'm looking for this, and we can help them. But for now, you need to learn about this world. And as you know, when you've done reader's advisory, the more you know about what someone's looking for, the easier it is for you to recommend a book to them. And the same thing is true for gaming. You can't just wander into a local game shop and say, hey, you know, I'd like a game that'll be like fun and stuff. That's not going to help. What they're going to do is point to the newest hyped games because the marketing engine that's out there really drives you towards the newest stuff. But if you have some specific things, I'm looking for a game of this style that's cooperative in this way, that doesn't have a lot of chance, that people could play it in 10 minutes and get a feel of it. What do you have? That's going to really limit the space of games down to just a few and help you make good choices. And that's what this is really about. So again, you're going to make good choices of games because those choices of games can then be justified up through the variables, up through the type of tournament you want to run or type of event you want to run, up through the game archetypes. The archetypes were selected because of the mission of the gaming program. The mission of the gaming program was selected because of the mission of the library. And now you have a way of connecting all those dots uh, back to why are we playing World of Warcraft? Well, now you have answers because it makes sense. It ties all the way back, and that's what this is all about. Now you know the process on figuring out how to select the games, but you're going to have to find some people to help you. And tomorrow, I'm going to talk a little bit about marketing and partnerships. Um, after that, I'll talk about actually getting the games, putting it together into a program, and then assessing that program. So that's it for now. And if you want to talk about this episode, head over to ALA Connect, where you can chat with others about this and all of the other episodes of this show. And that's enough for now, so I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.